Okay, so we're reading the Bhagavad Gita as it is, um, translated by Prabhupada. We'll start with a short incantation. Omagana Timrandasya Gananjana Shalakya Takshuru Militam Yenam Taisma Shri Gurve Namaha Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya All right, so we're on text 33. I will share my screen. Text 53. Shuti viparat piana te Yadash de taiti nishkala Samadav akala buddhis tada yogam avapasyasi. When your mind is no longer disturbed by the flowery language of the Vedas, and when it remains fixed in the trance of self realization, then you will have attained divine consciousness. To say that one is in samadhi is to say that one has fully realized Krishna consciousness. That is, one in full samadhi has realized Brahman, Paramatman, and Bhagavan. The highest perfection of self-realization is to understand that one is eternally in the service of Krishna and that one's only business is to discharge one's duties in Krishna consciousness. A Krishna conscious person or unflinching devotee of the Lord should not be disturbed by the flowery language of the Vedas, nor be engaged in fruitive activities for promotion to the heavenly kingdom. In Krishna consciousness, one comes directly into communion with Krishna, and thus all directions from Krishna may be understood on that transcendental state. One is sure to achieve results by such activities and attain conclusive knowledge. One has only to carry out the orders of Krishna or his representative, the spiritual master. Arjuna Vaka Shtita Pajnasya Kabasa Samadhi Stasya Keshava Shtita Di Kim Prabhasteta Kim Asita Vraja Telkim. Arjuna said, What are the symptoms of one whose consciousness is thus merged in the transcendence? How does he speak and what is his language? How does he sit and how does he walk? Are there symptoms for each and every man in terms of his particular situation? Similarly, one who is in Krishna consciousness has his particular nature, talking, walking, thinking, feeling, etc. As a rich man has his symptoms by which he is known as a rich man. As a diseased man has his symptoms by which he is known as a diseased or a learned man has his symptoms. So a man in transcendental consciousness of Krishna has specific symptoms and various dealings. One can know his specific symptoms from Bhagavad Gita. Most important is how the man in Krishna consciousness speaks, for speech is the most important quality of any man. It is said that a fool is undiscovered as long as he does not speak, and certainly a well-dressed fool cannot be identified unless he speaks, but as soon as he speaks, he reveals himself at once. The immediate symptom of a Krishna conscious man is that he speaks only of Krishna and of matters relating to him. Other symptoms then automatically follows as stated below. Sri Bhagavan Uvaka Prajahati Yada Kamam Sarvan Parta Manogatan Atmani Evatmana Tushta Shtita Prajnas Tato Kyaye Sri Bhagavan, the Blessed Lord, oh, the Blessed Lord said, O Parta, when a man gives up all varieties of sense desire which arise from mental concoction, and when his mind finds satisfaction in the self alone, then he said it to be in pure transcendental consciousness. The Bhagavatam affirms that any person who is fully in Krishna consciousness or devotional service of the Lord has all the good qualities of the great sages, where a person who is not so transcendentally situated has no good qualifications because he is sure to be taking refuge in his own mental concoctions. Consequently, it is rightly said herein that one has to give up all kinds of sense desire manufactured by consciousness. Then automatically sense desires subside without extraneous efforts. Therefore, one has to engage himself in Krishna consciousness without hesitation, for this devotional service will instantly help one onto the platform of transcendental consciousness. The highly developed soul always remains satisfied in himself by realizing himself as the eternal servitor of the Supreme Lord. Such a transcendentally situated person has no sense desires resulting from petty materialism, Rather, he remains always happy in his natural position of eternally serving the Supreme Lord. 
Dukashu, Amud Vigna, Mana, Sukeshu, Vigata, Stra, Vita, Raga, Baya, Kroda, Shtita, Dir, Munir, Ukayute. One who is not disturbed in spite of the threefold miseries, that's the gunas, who is not elated when there is happiness and who is free from attachment, fear, and anger is called the stage of steady mind. The word muni means one who can agitate his mind in various ways from mental speculation without coming to a factual conclusion. It is said that every muni has a different angle of vision and unless a muni differs from other munis, he cannot be called a muni in the strict sense of the term. Nasau munir yasya matam nabinam but ashtita di muni, as mentioned here and by the Lord, is different from an ordinary muni. The stita di muni is always in Krishna consciousness, for he has exhausted all his business of creative speculation. He has surpassed the stage of mental speculations and has come to the conclusion that Lord Sri Krishna or Vasudeva is everything. He is called a muni fixed in mind. Such a fully Krishna conscious person is not at all disturbed by the onslaughts of the threefold miseries. For he accepts all miseries as the mercy of the Lord, thinking himself only worthy of more trouble due to his past misdeeds, and he sees that his miseries, by the grace of the Lord, are minimized to the lowest. Similarly, when he is happy, he gives credit to the Lord, by the grace of the Lord, oh sorry, he gives credit to the Lord, thinking himself unworthy of the happiness. He realizes that it is only due to the Lord's grace that he is in such a comfortable condition and able to render better service to the Lord. And for the service of the Lord, he is always daring and active and is not influenced by attachment or aversion. Attachment means accepting things for one's own sense gratification. And detachment is the absence of such sensual attachment. But one fixed in Krishna consciousness has neither attachment or detachment because his life is dedicated in the service of the Lord. Consequently, he is not at all angry even when his attempts are unsuccessful. A Krishna conscious person is always steady in his determination. Okay, so they're talking about... You know, I usually teach from the Jnana Yoga and the Raja Yoga tradition when it comes to the um, something being klishta, which is um, like a colored thought, a thought that's colored with addiction or aversion. Um, and then a klishta is a neutral thought. So the idea here is that rather than it being neutral, it's a thought that's absorbed in the consciousness of the divine. That's the idea of bhakti. Right, so you'll see people walking around with their hands in their mala bags and all the time they're chanting the name of the Lord internally. They've, they're doing the count on their mala beads, doing japa mala. Right, they'll sing in the streets, the Hare Krishna mantra. They'll you know, sing in the temples, Hare Krishna mantra. And the idea is that you know, there are really... It's almost like um, by attaching yourself to that, you supersede or transcend the attachments of the material world, right? It, it gives you a filled up feeling inside, which naturally arises when you transcend the duality of attachment of I like it, I hate it, I want it, I don't want it, right? That's sort of back and forth that most people are existing in often. Okay. Text 57. Ya sarva trana bishnehas tatat prapya suba subam nabi anantati nadvesti tasya prajna pratishtita. He who is without attachment, who does not rejoice when he obtains good, nor lament when he obtains evil, is firmly fixed in perfect knowledge. There is always some upheaval in the material world which may be good or evil. One who is not agitated by such material upheavals, who is unaffected by good and evil, is to be understood to be fixed in Krishna consciousness. As long as one is in the material world, there is always the possibility of good and evil because this world is full of duality. But one who is fixed in Krishna consciousness is not affected by good and evil because he is simply concerned with Krishna, who is all good absolute. Such consciousness in Krishna situates one in a perfect transcendental position called technically samadhi. Yada samharati chayam Kurmo viganaiva sarvasa indriyana indriyana rete bs tasya prajna pratishtita. It's like the longest word I've ever seen. 
one who is able to withdraw his senses from sense objects as the tortoise draws his limbs within his shell is to be understood as truly situated in knowledge. The test of a yogi, devotee, or self-realized soul is that he is able to control the senses according to his plan. Most people, however, are servants to the senses and are thus directed by the dictation of the senses. That is the answer to the question as to how a yogi is situated. The senses are compared to venomous serpents. They want to act very loosely and without restriction. The yogi or the devotee must be very strong to control the serpents, like a snake charmer. He never allows them to act independently. There are many injunctions in the revealed scriptures. Some of them are do nots and some of them are do's. Unless one is able to follow the do's and the do nots, restricting oneself from sense enjoyment, it is not possible to be firmly fixed in Krishna consciousness. The best example set herein is the tortoise. The tortoise can at any moment wind up his senses and exhibit them again at any time for a particular purpose. Similarly, the senses of the Krishna conscious person are used only for some particular purpose in the service of the Lord and are withdrawn otherwise. Keeping the senses always in the service of the Lord is the example set by the analogy of the tortoise who keeps the senses within. So it may seem like this is restrictive or maybe not a great way to live. Always have your senses within, but that's sort of viewing it from the mindset that maybe we've experienced thus far, right? When you are in this state, there's, there's an inner bliss that you are residing in that's beyond the duality of the senses, right? The senses cause problems for us because they're always saying, you can't be satisfied because you don't have this. You need to go get that, go get this, go get that. What are you doing? Go get this, go get that, right? And it creates this external focus where we can never really reconnect to the inner self because all the attention is outside of ourselves. So the yogi trains their senses to be able to turn inward at any given moment when they decide. It's almost like um, if you're in a fight with someone and they're screaming in your face, <laughs> there might be that sense um, desire to like, injure them or get angry and fight back or but there's a superpower in the yogi's ability to pull the senses inward and then act from wisdom instead right and that's like with any extreme circumstance the yogi should be able to it's like on the mat we're always talking about that okay you're sweating and you're struggling and you're suffering now draw your attention inside <laughs> draw it deeper than your mind right Draw deeper than the duality of the mind, the duality of the senses. It's like, it, it, it is transcendence, right? It's a transcendence over the material. Okay, the next is text 59. Vishaya vinivarante nira rasya denina rasa vajram raso pyasya param drishva nivartate the embodied soul may be restricted from sense enjoyment, though a taste for the sense objects remains. But ceasing such engagements by experiencing a higher taste, he is fixed in consciousness. Unless one is transcendentally situated, it is not possible to cease from sense enjoyment. The process of restriction from sense enjoyment by rules and regulations is something like restricting a diseased person from certain types of eatables. The patient, however, neither likes such restrictions nor loses his taste for eatables. Similarly, sense restriction by some spiritual process like Ashtanga Yoga in the matter of the Yama Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyani, etc. is recommended for less intelligent persons who have no better knowledge. But one who has tasted the beauty of the Supreme Lord Krishna in the course of his advancement in Krishna consciousness no longer has a taste for dead material things. Therefore, restrictions are there for the less intelligent neophytes in the spiritual advancement of life. But such restrictions are only good if one actually has a taste for Krishna consciousness. When one is actually Krishna conscious, he is automatically loses his taste for pale things. I mean, this is kind of like a condescending way that he's saying what he's saying, but I'm just going to like supersede what he's saying to <laughs> say that um, in the beginning, we need someone to tell us like, okay, this is wrong. 
and this is right. My, my teacher calls it guardrails. You put up the guardrails while you're bowling. So the ball stays in the lane. It's not a less intelligent thing. It's just where has our awareness been trained all of our lives, right? If your awareness has been trained to the material, you're going to remain in the material and be sort of caught up in the influences of the material, which can lead us awry. Right? It can seem attractive to be cruel or um, attractive or to lie or steal or all these things that the Yamas and Yamas teach us not to do. Right. So it's not, I don't, it's not nice to say it's an intelligence thing. I almost feel like, that, go ahead. I almost feel like, like, because I read that for the advanced course lesson two, and it was talking about like this idea of like they would say something and then they say something else and it like contradicts the first thing and it can get really frustrating for someone like me who's like, well, what, what do you mean? But they break it down like that, that you, you learn one thing and you learn the opposite and both can be true and you have to find like the middle point of it. But like, mm. I so like, this is where I'm going with this is like, I'm not trying to argue with you. I'm just trying mm -hmm. to find the other side of it. I'm trying to like train myself to see both sides of the, so like for the intelligent thing, maybe it's just how we've thought of ourselves as intelligent. Like, yeah, you're right. Maybe. So like he's, I don't think he's saying like less intelligent, like as far as like someone who has their doctorate degree, but like, as far as the intelligence that they teach us in the yoga philosophy of like the different stages of our animal mind, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. I can get down with that. <laughs> Cause like, it's, it's that idea of like, um, we get offended that we're being called not intelligent when we are intelligent people, but we're really not that intelligent people. Right, it's he's saying hard. less intelligent persons who have no better knowledge. So yeah, knowledge so we don't, now. We don't have the knowledge of it yet. Mm. So a better word might be ignorant and not ignorant because ignorant right. is not having the knowledge and has nothing to do with intelligence. Ignorant <laughs> though could be, so like, I feel like if we are gonna talk about me, like I, I do not, I agree with, he's recommended for less intelligent persons who have no better knowledge. Well, I'm not offended by this because I've never been given the knowledge like my parents, the teachers along the way haven't given me the knowledge. So I think that's fair. Ignorance also a fair word, but that's also like a very, um, people get very defensive when they hear Oh my that. God, I've had so many fights when I say <laughs> to my husband, like, oh, you're ignorant of this particular thing. Like not in an offensive way, just meaning yeah. like you don't know about it. And I'm using, you know, the word, he would get so mad at me. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I was right. like, no, in I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> in our culture, the both intelligence and ignorance have become emotionally <laughs> laden and it, and it's too bad it's unfair because it doesn't leave you a lot of words and there's a difference between intelligence and ignorance and it doesn't leave you a lot of words you know it's true <laughs> oh, I think wow. um I almost feel like you could tie ignorance into intelligence so like an intelligent person when they do get the knowledge they can choose to use it or not and that's where ignorance comes in where you can't be ignorant to something you don't really know anything about. I mean, that's not. Well, yeah, that's, okay. that's, that's what the word is, though. That's where Mark always gets <laughs> upset with me. Like, ignorance just means you're not aware. Just, right. You don't know. You if haven't you been exposed. You haven't been taught. You yeah, yeah, yeah. That's ignorance. And so you can be ignorant about something you don't know anything about because that's exactly what ignorance is. Yeah. You're unintelligent if once you're exposed, you don't take that information and try to evaluate it no matter where you come okay, out. Okay, so I just have that. it backwards. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it seems like he's using the word intelligent sort of like you're saying, Sue, like intelligent means that you know. Well. Yeah. Oh, well, you know. the converse I, of ignorance. But yeah, I definitely, you know, look at me. Look at me, I got all huffy about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, look at how loaded these words are, but that's the reality of it. So you can't ignore it. And, and, it, and <laughs> it does generate this kind of discussion. Well, and I can, yeah, I could see how this could be a very heated discussion. 
like in especially in Amanda and like a yoga teacher training circle with some with some people they could get yeah. very <laughs> I had to have them stop reading this version of the book because they would have nervous breakdowns <laughs> like the first two trainings they would I would ask them to read this whole book on their own and they just absolutely lost their minds so now we read the abbreviated version which is less intense Yeah. yeah, it's yeah, because it is. Is that the? It's like the abridged version of the same translation. Yeah, exactly. That's the one that I got by mistake first, and and you're right because I was, I was reading that for a little while until the full version arrived, and it it is because it compresses so much. It's it is less intense. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, I think to be fair, like if you're new to this, like me, if you're not reading this in a in a way where there can be discussion it's yeah. hard to absorb this information for amen. me amen it the same is true for me if i wasn't uh, if we didn't have these meetings in the morning and couldn't have i mean some of it seems pretty clear and pretty open but there's a lot that the commentary um amanda that you offer really makes a huge difference in the discussions pan that sometimes you initiate really mm -hmm. well, well but also like it becomes it's it to me, that becomes like ignorant learning because I'm only learning with the intelligence I know, I guess. So it's mm. like, it becomes a very one-sided learning. And I guess that's for any self-learning, but you wouldn't have like the other side or how other people are viewing the same sentence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, anyway. Should I keep going or should we? Um, oh, it's 804. Maybe we should just pause and breath. Yeah, so we'll start off with um, text 60 next time. <clears throat> Let me take the right hand thumb. And close off the right nostril take your right ring finger and close off the left nostril inhale through both and exhale through both inhale through the left nostril exhale through the right inhale through the right exhale through the left inhale through the left Exhale through the right. Inhale through the right. Exhale to the left. Inhale to the left. Exhale to the right. Inhale to the right. Exhale to the left. Inhale to the left. Exhale through the right. Inhale through the right. Exhale through the left. Inhale through the left. Exhale through the right. Inhale through the right. Exhale through the left. Inhaling and exhaling. Moving into your 20 minutes.
Bring the hands to prayer, going ahead. Namaste. Namaste, thank you. Thank you girls, have a great day. <laughs> you know?